My name is Christian. I'm going to be building a timber frame structure that's going to serve as a proof of concept for a house I'm planning on building in a few years. We're going to start with this, to this, to this, to this. Let's get started. So this is what's going to become the top plate. So far, I have put a nice cross on each end. Um, I actually did that while I was hewing this down to size. You can see some of the spots like here, which are kind of original from the first hewing I did. I'll include a link to that video. It's not the right way to do it, but it worked, so <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. Um, so this is a 24-ish foot, maybe closer to 22 at this point, uh, 6 by 8 and this is probably the closest to actual dimension I have out of the other ones that are over there, which I'll go over in a sec. Um, but all I've done so far is I've snapped some center lines along, haven't done any of the other work on this, so I'll be taking it from pretty much raw timber, or I guess a raw cant with um, just some basic lines snapped on it to what you see over here. These are the other two top plates. This one is what I believe you'd call the ridge beam. Uh, this piece is a nice chunk of ash that we took down on this property a little while ago. It's still wet, so we'll see how badly it continues to check, but I'm optimistic. Um, this one was done on the sawmill, so it's a bit more consistent than some of the other ones, though given the piece of, or given the log I had to work with, it wasn't fully to size. So you can see there's some rounded corners, but again, for this application, it should be fine. Um, you can see we've got the notches for the rafters, and we've got the mortise and the sword hilt for where it's going to sit on the, uh, on the uh, posts in the structure. And I've got some kind of cryptic markings that I should have already gone over in CAD, but um, I'll either do that at the beginning of the video or throughout um, how I'm doing the offsets, because these are not all the same size. Some are close to 7x7s, seven seven, some are close to 6x8s, and especially the ones that are hand-hewn, uh, they're kind of all, all in between. And if we look down these, you can kind of see how much it jogs back and forth. Um, to the point where this one I actually offset let's see offset this from the center line which is here um, and this is a good example of where I'm not doing a lot of math but there's a lot of uh, thinking through the geometry involved um, but each one of these took me about a day to do so we'll see how long uh, this video takes the, these ones I spent a lot of time getting the layout right just because they're so curved in multiple dimensions. This one we're doing today is a bit more straightforward. I'm less worried about that. Um, so I sh the layout should be a little bit more straightforward. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, jump into it. All right, so now we've got the line snapped on here. I've got my story pole that's been all set up. I've double checked all my measurements. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is marking where, uh, where the mortises are going to go and where the center of the, uh, um, of the beam is going to be. And you'll see me flipping this back and forth a few times. That's primarily going to be because um, I didn't have a piece long enough for a full 22-foot uh, story pole. So instead, um, I'm just going to be flipping it back and forth because it's mirrored one side versus the other. So I'm going to mark it on this side and then bring the lines all the way around. We'll see how well the wind cooperates today.
So what I'm doing is I'm setting up the square against the center line and then using that to essentially create a T with the leg along the center line. You don't have a full square at the edge, you can guesstimate it, but what I'll be doing is on every side I'll be double checking with the story pull to make sure I haven't uh, diverged too much doing stuff like this. Okay, on to the next side. Let's start with the center. Right here. So again, I'm coming uh, to the center line. Getting it line, everything lined up, and pulling that line back across. I think I said this in a previous video, but ideally you'd be using a proper uh, T-square for this. I don't have one, and I've been too lazy to make one. So this is what I have to end up doing. It takes about twice as long to do the layout, but it's a nice break at the beginning of the day before you really get into actually taking a lot of wood off. Lining up.
That's actually an old marking. This is, that's pretty funny. This is not the lines I just drew. And I'm sure those of you watching realized I was drawing on the, on the uh, I was pulling the lines from the wrong side of where I had just marked. as I go with the story pole, because in theory, all the distances should stay the same all the way around, within a pencil line or so. Okay, that does line up. Time to rotate again. And this part's pretty formulaic, going through the motions. check with the story pole, the distance between these lines, and I'm actually going to add a, a few of the, the uh, mortise uh, marks, I guess the, where exactly I'm going to be boring the holes for the mortise, is that way I don't have to flip it over uh, again and find where I, which pile of wood chips I dropped this, and that's the problem, is I should have painted this bright orange or something, because I'll knock it off of this, it'll go on the wood chip pile, and I'll spend 15 minutes trying to find it. Thank 
close. So this one, I did something wrong along the way. So given that those two are correct and this one's not, this one must have skewed this way just to here, so I'm just going to correct that manually. Again, the cleaner you can get, your, the cleaner you can get your beams ahead of time, the less corrections you'll need to make. Um, but I'm only off by maybe an eighth of an inch, which. All things considered, is not that bad for what I'm doing here. Now we take our template and simply line up the uh, X's, or I guess um, line up the lines that are going across. Also checking while I'm doing this is that I actually have about two inches on either side, which means that this center line is actually in the center. Um, on some of these pieces, when they curve like this, you actually have to offset what you think the center line is, because if you mark it only at the ends, at the middle, it's going to be off by a huge amount. And I'll, I'll, I'll have gone over that in the beginning a little bit, um, as far as some of the adjustments you can make to the center line to get your beams to come out a little bit stronger. if they're as weird as mine. Okay, so from here to here. This is, what I end up doing here is I actually mark the center between the two sides on here, and then I use that to see how far off the square that is. And usually it's pretty darn close. Um, yeah, this one's pretty much dead on. You see, that's lined up pretty nicely with that. It's not going to be perfect, and for this piece I don't really care too, too much. But Close enough.
go to do well on this, on this side before is mark it with the template again. That's all we need to uh, begin work on drilling the holes for the mortises.
That is the knot that was inside of here. That I've been pounding away against. If you can avoid it, don't mortise through knots. It still looks possible in there. For the record, don't do that. It's not good for your chisels and it's a very good way to bend them. So there's a knot here running this way, and there's also a knot deep in the piece here. It's making this so much fun. <laughs> the rest of these should be quite a bit cleaner, as those ones I actively try to avoid knots, but sometimes for the given piece you just don't have much of a choice. looking along the side and kind of checking against this and then adjusting as I can. into the knot again. There we go.
reasonable, reasonable, reasonable. And it's alright not to mention. we've had in quite some time. It's been uh, a little bit too warm for my liking. It's about 65 and sunny today, which is just perfect for my standards anyway. I just don't want this bouncing all over the place as I'm working. Good enough. Several, several times before, but I have to adjust the kerf on the saw at some point. I still have not picked up a saw set or bothered to do it by hand again. But that's close enough for now. Thank you. 
idea was to put this on here. Oh yeah, it's fine.
before I go too much further, I should check this one. That's actually looking pretty good on that side. I guess I didn't go too far at all. That's I gotta go deeper there. And on this side, take that down a bit. Alright, I think I'm happy with that. Next step is the rafters after lunch. Here we go. So, here we are on the center mortise for this beam. Got my template ready. And, nope. So here we are on the center mortise for this beam. You can see I've already got it roughly lined out here. Um, so I'm just going to take this is, I don't know, maybe inch and a quarter bore and uh, make my way through in four different spots and then break out using a chisel uh, the remainder of the wood. a little bit more comfortably. There we go. So I'm offsetting, I'm, well I'm sighting straight down, I'm not sure if you can see my head from here, but I'm looking straight down this way and I'm sighting against the lines here and I'm leaving myself between a sixteenth and, and, and an eighth of an inch. I get it started and then I double check to make sure that's parallel and as I'm sighting this way it's pretty much straight up and down. Start working my way in. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to about here-ish, somewhere in here, um, in each one of these holes. Break out a bunch of the stuff in a kind of a rough fashion, and then flip it over. Do the same thing on the other side, and then clean up the hole. Especially on the first hole, I keep sighting down, making sure I'm not coloring too far outside the lines. The inside of the mortise doesn't matter quite as much if it's a little bit hollow. Makes it easier to actually put the structure together. 
but too loose and it's not the best thing in the world. So this one's much nicer than, than the one I did earlier. I'm not sure if I'm going to show that or not because I didn't actually get the audio working correctly. So it's 15, 20 minutes of absolutely no audio. But I don't know. My goal for a lot of this is to show in real time how long it takes to make each one of these pieces so you can get a feeling for overall how much time this takes. This whole project is over the course of a year or so, but that's mostly due to the fact that I have a day job. And this is kind of just a hobby for me, but because of current global situation, I have plenty of time to spend out here where this project is taking place. I'm still working, working full time during the week for the most part, but I get plenty of time on the weekends to dive into this. And if I get up early enough, I can also do some work on this. But as I'm going through, as you can see, from time to time I'm changing my grip. There's some softer spots different layers in the wood, depending on how fast the tree was growing and a couple other factors, or how much the lead screw is biting in. So right now I'm putting a good amount of downward pressure, because if I just do this, it's only shaving off a very small amount. Um, for harder woods, you don't have to worry about that as much, um, but this pine is soft enough that the lead screw does well enough, but it doesn't really pull the bore properly into the wood. So come back half a turn and then pull it out. I'm going to do two holes like this and then two holes like this, clean up the small amount between the holes and then I can pop nice large chunks out of here. Ideally I'd have a two inch auger, but unfortunately I've not found a nice one at the local junk, uh, junk shops and can't really go out to those right now. So making do with the tools I've got on hand. Checking. Oh, that's shaky. You'll probably be able to see better than I can how well I'm doing keeping this upright. But even if I'm off by... So if I'm aiming a quarter inch off on the bottom, when I'm stopping about in the middle, I'm only going to be an eighth of an inch off, um, which I'll see on the other side and can correct for. Also, on whichever side becomes the top, I actually will widen the mortise as I'll be driving wedges into the tenon to lock it in place. <clears throat> you can see, again, I changed my grip, pushing down to make it through that layer that's not as conducive to the bore. I said this earlier, but I was when the audio was off, but doing this in pine really isn't that bad at all. The rest of the mortises after this piece on the structure are all in somewhat dry, but still a little bit green ash. And that's going to be kind of fun. And by fun, I mean a crop ton of work. Got 28 mortises to do in ash. That's off. <clears throat> 
as the lead screw loses its grip, to start pushing it back in. That's good enough. Let's back between quarter and a half a turn and pull it right up. You don't want to put too much pressure on the lead screw, but if you don't, um, if you back it off too far, you'll end up making a mess. And getting and you can get this jammed, especially when the wood is this resinous. So now that I've got the holes bored in, I can come through, clear out the waste between, a little bit by little bit. Still need to put a new handle on this chisel, at least clean this one up. Got this off eBay a few months ago. Reasonably happy with it. So at this point, I'm not quite going as far as I could toward the line, leaving myself a good amount of room for cleanup. So now that I've got kind of the C cleared out, I can come into the, whoop, come into the meat of it and start taking out larger pieces. So that's as clean as I need to get this side. I'm going to start, well, as far as the center goes, a little bit of cleanup on the edges, take out some of the space around this borehole, and then and this one, and then flip it over. Edge here. Hopefully reduce the tear up by doing that.
do that every once in a while so that it doesn't get too stuck in there. And I'm checking to make sure that's roughly in line there. All right, I'm happy enough with that. Time to flip. And back to the board.
Just back to the same thing we did on the other side.
reasonably close. Let's start using the template to see where we need a little bit more work. Just a hair up either side. That's good. What about this direction? That's actually pretty good. This side, sighting down it, I can see it kind of curves in like that. So I'll have to come back through and address that. Let's see, green's pretty much parallel, so I don't have to worry too much about splitting a ton off accidentally. Okay, I'm happy with that. So the next step is to start clearing out cheeks through here. I've got a nice little ledge to set the chisel on. side. Similar thing over here now. Fits pretty well. Same there. Nice. So the last trick is this dimension, which we did earlier. And I can see, as I said before, this is kind of curving through like that. Take a little bit off, flip, and then finish the other side. Much better. Still not perfect, but a definite step in the right direction. Oh, I'm going to take just a hair off of here. I can see this one bowing out. Side, maybe not as much. Yeah, I can feel that's 
surface right there sticks out a little bit further. Again, get that set. Take a little bit off on the way down. So we verified that dimensionally that mostly works. So flip, clean out the other side, and use the uh, slick to make sure everything is actually passable all the way through. Because what can happen is if this is skewed one way or another, you won't really be able to see it on the way through. But as long as both sides, at least the first inch, can fit this, and you use your slick stuck through. And I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a sec to check how straight this these edges are. You can be reasonably confident that it, your uh, joint should fit on the first try. There. So that's the next thing we're working on. I'm just going to just pop this off because this was digging into my leg last time. I'm just taking a hair off piece by piece, hopefully. Pairing. Gotten reasonably lucky here. Where this grain, uh, the grain orientation of wood is right where I want it, so I don't have to worry too much about splitting off large portions of the side. Though I should probably reserve that sort of comment until after I finish with that. So that's a bit. back through this.
at this point, I'm going to switch over to the slick. It's not, as far as I know, not traditionally what this is for, but it works. At least for me. Remarkably well for getting insides of these mortises cleaned out. So, if you're not careful, you actually blow out a little bit of the bottom, which I just did. Which means that the bottom is a little bit wider than it needs to be now. I should really only be using it about that deep. Anywhere in here, I can push a little bit too hard and actually pop a little bit of the bottom of the joint out. Not great. So up until now, I've just been eyeballing it. Let me bring out some of the shavings real quick. And I'm gonna use the slick to make sure the sides are straight and aren't bowed out into the joint. So I'm not sure how much you can see this, but I'm currently rotating it into position. And this edge, I can see the slick is touching pretty much all the way down, which means this is pretty close to straight on the inside. On the other side, I can see there's actually, it's bowing out. And here's, so that's the next thing I take a little bit off of. The key here is not stabbing yourself while you're doing this, so that would not be a good day. Alright, that's better. Try the other side. It's also looking pretty good. Myself more accidentally <laughs> punching the wood like that than I do with the sharp end of the tools because you're thinking about the sharp end of the tool almost constantly, or you should be, and you're not thinking as much about oh, I could accidentally, accidentally bump into that, and that's a hard edge right there. So, right now, I'm just taking a quick look side to side, and I think I'm going to leave this two-dimension at some point on either end I'm going to take about a quarter inch additionally here but I want to talk about that process when we get to actually putting in the sword joints I need to take a little bit off that side as well. But before I forget, Same thing we did on the other side. Just getting this dug in a little bit, slowly rotating it into a position where I can start. Yep, so the access. Let's take a look and see how that looks now. I think we're almost done. That's pretty good. So it feels pretty good. 
Good, good, and good. All right, on to the next one. Hopefully this view will give you a little bit of a better idea of what's going on. And hopefully the camera won't get jostled too, too much. I guess the nice thing is now I can just lean over and take a look. Make sure you can see what I see. Get up to there. I've got about a quarter inch of clearance between the handle on this auger and the clip that I'm using to hold the phone and the battery to the stick I have propped up against a piece of scrap wood. Nope, that did it. Temper that a little bit further. How's that looking? That should be all right. Try moving this just a little bit. Hopefully that won't let go. Now I've got room to work. Coming over to the opposite side, same corner. Checking it's reasonably straight up and down. If anything, I want to dig in this way and toward the center. Because that's easy enough to correct with a chisel later on. I'm 
actually way off axis there. Chest. And again, just clearing out space between these so I can take some larger pieces out eventually. I'm going to put this a little bit closer to the edge than I did last time and see how big of a chunk I can break out. 
I'm a little bit worried it's going to strain to this, but eh, kind of curious what's going to happen. Yeah, it worked pretty well. Take all these nice big chunks right out. Also, you might see me going like, going like this a little bit deeper into the cut. I'm not sure if you can actually see this on here, but this, whoever owned it first either bent it or it came bent. I honestly don't know. Um, The other side is so much easier. So all the shavings and chunks just drop right through. Same thing over here. We start taking a look at the template. So that's acceptable. It's not fantastic, but it's acceptable.
enough for now. Time to flip. So this side is was a little bit harder to see. Double check the lines are the ones I think they are, so that's there. That's close enough. Check vertical. That's the corner there. So we come through closer.
go. Oh, come on. Okay.
too shabby. Be better, could be worse. Time to switch over to the slick. Now I can put this in, twist it up against the side and sight down here. I'll do it in a few different directions so you can see kind of what I'm looking at. So I can see that right there is just a little bit high. Come back through and That one went pretty smooth. And I'm just gonna clean this up. Through here. Here you can see, hopefully, well, I'm not sure how much you can see, but this, I hold this here, angles this way, so I've got to come back down through and clear that out. And I think this one's good. been a little bit too deep back in there. Okay, I can live with that. Laying out the uh, sword joints. Sword hilts? I don't know. Alright, so 
now that we've got the uh, mortise put through, we have to set up the sword hilt, sword joint. I don't know. I got to look up my actual terminology for this. Um, so what I've done, and I've, I've hopefully explained this well at the beginning of the video uh, or in another video using CAD, but um, this right here is the proper layout of this with this bottom one being the center line. So this is a zero inch offset here. Um, because this beam is curved, I actually need to offset it about a half an inch. And I've done that in all the other locations along and set this down and marked. And I'll have to adjust the rafters accordingly and you'll see that later on. So that's about as far as we can go for now. I'm gonna kind of rough this in. That, I don't have an awesome way of getting that lined up at this point. I just want to rough it in and then put a piece of something straight here to actually make sure that once you have that flat edge there, you can start adjusting it that way. So I need to go grab my saw, so I'll be right back. Okay, so I grabbed this off from the workbench, and I'm going to be cutting down through there, so I've got to turn the log back upright. I guess technically it's upside down. Does that matter? Yeah, because in the center it's off. Okay, that makes sense. I put that on the wrong side, didn't I? That's funny. up on the correct side this time. Now that we've got our markings in place, we can cut down to the line and uh, then start chopping that out. So now we have a line to work with, and as we're chopping in, like this, we won't, if we start a split, it won't carry over into the wood that we want to keep. This part is pretty satisfying, as long as you don't go too far, too fast. Now 
Here, I can split this off without worrying about damaging this piece. close there. and see how this is doing. So that's actually not bad at all. Actually pretty close to where I want to be. This side's a little bit high and this side's a little bit high, but that's mostly just pairing work at this point. 
angled in. I might be over exaggerating here a little bit on that, but we want the outside to touch and the inside to be slightly concave here. over exaggerated how far you want to make that go but that is what it is I'm still off by a good bit here. I'm just going to go back around the other side.
this up a hair more. And I think we're good. Hopefully the wind cooperates with this. I've got my rafter mark here and I am lining it up here. Two inches because I have four inches on either side. Sorry, two inches on either side. Strike that up, come up two inches, which is what was on the template, and then come over there to here. There, two inches, I should mark that correctly, two inches, uh, two inches is actually there, across, And that's what we're going to be removing. So, turn this back on end. And I just realized this is the wrong side for you guys to see this. All right. It should be pretty straightforward though. Just cutting a notch. So, that's going to be fairly deep. Ouch. Lesson learned. Hopefully. So I'm starting off at a fairly steep angle, and then I'm going to match it to um, the level in the uh, yeah the level in the angle that I've got set on the gauge. Actually, this is the line I'm going. Here. Alright, so with a little bit of geometry, I was able to make sure to strike a line across this. This is actually grab the pattern to match. Or rather, match the pattern. And this is what I used to set this gauge for the raptures. So it's gonna sit like that like that. So what I did is I uh, drew a line from corner to corner to cut the angle in half and lined up the angle gauge and part of the problem is this face is not necessarily perpendicular to the inside of the mortise um, which is what we're going to be everything is going to be referenced off of. Um, so what I've done is I've re-leveled this looking at the lines on the end that the uh, central lines were pulled from. And now when I hold this on here at level, hopefully you can see, I'm in frame, um, I could hold this up against the side in either direction. And as long as the bubble is level, I've got the angle I need. Um, so I start off pretty steep and then slowly flatten it out to match. 
So, because I just made these cuts, I can come back through. Pop that right off. So, that looks actually to be close to the right angle, but I've got another inch or so to go. So let's take a quick look at this. Actually, we do need to go even further down the angle to even match that. But having done a bunch of these, I know that I've got a ways to go. At least this frees up the sucker. to go even deeper on this one. So we are actually, I could be wrong on that, that is pretty darn close to level. So I'm just going to take the slick real quick, clean this up. Clean this up here, and that's pretty much done.
good.
so quickly before I go too much further, um, I actually want to widen these tops here uh, so that I can drive wedges in uh, into the tenon, which spreads it and keeps it in the mortise. So this is the completed, and I do mean completed, 6x8 top plate. You can see down in here, reasonably clean. We'll see how much adjustments I need to make as I actually assemble the structure, but I'll be doing some dry fitting on the ground. But all of these rafter slots should be at the exact 
right location. Modulo a very small amount of shift side to side, just because this piece isn't uniform, but should be close. This right here is going to be interesting. So when I put the tenon in here, I'm going to have to go up with a saw and a chisel and actually pop this same angle out so the rafter can sit on it. Um, that should be interesting, but not too bad. There we go. And here you can see the sword joint. So the post will sit here, ten going up through, and locked in at the top with two small wedges which spread the end, end of the tenon. So I think that's about it for today. Um, hopefully this hasn't been too boring for you. There's a lot of repetition, but that's kind of what I want to show is how long it actually takes to do each one of these components piece by piece. Um, so hopefully you'll tune into the next one. See you then.